it's not easily possible in an in person event the goal of this conference is to create an opportunity for the participants to think and collaborate in transdisciplinary subjects and speakers from different scientific expertise will share their knowledge and experience with this it's my privilege to welcome you all for the inauguration of virtual international Transdis transdisciplinary conference now i invite professor a mary soral d school of advanced sciences to deliver the welcome address please ma'am thank you our honorable chancellor prospective chief guest guest of honor respected pro vice chancellor invited speakers from various countries and across the world faculty colleagues and my dear students participants as well as the students from vit a warm greetings to one and all present here so i cannot greet you good morning but still i greet you good morning and good evening for the participation from various countries on behalf of the vit management and local organizing committee and on my own behalf it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you for this virtual international transdisciplinary conference organized by department of physics school of advanced sciences i deem it a pleasure and honor to welcome our honorable chancellor for this international conference we are blessed and honored to have you sir in midst of your busy schedule so i think that we have various series of meeting that has been scheduled but in spite of that you were kind enough to spare your valuable time to us so thank you so much once again our inspiration our motivator and put together we can say that he is the overall strength of vit so we are thank you very much sir for your continuous support to our school of advanced sciences in all the activities that we organize we are delighted to have our respected chief guest professor ram gopal the director of iit delhi on behalf of the esteemed management vit and faculty the students of vit school of advanced sciences and the students of advanced sciences it is my pleasure to welcome you sir thank you so much for sparing your valuable time with us and we hope to we are waiting to hear from you on the transdisciplinary research as well as innovations in sciences which is the need of the hour thank you very much sir it is also my great pleasure to invite our esteemed respected our vice president as well as the pro vice chancellor thank you very much sir for sparing your time with us and also thank you very much for your continuous support and guidance in all our academic activities thank you once again i also welcome my warm i extend my warm welcome to the guest of honor professor buzatia morozio from the university of salento italy we are thankful to you sir for having accepting our invitation and also for being with us the early time of your contribution thank you so much i also welcome the other speakers of the various uh, teams that we have today it's my pleasure to welcome professor yoshira from japan professor sumit alfi from uk professor buzapi morozio from italy professor kumar makesh and professor raghavan nadrajan from singapore professor harish kumar from japan professor satoshi kodako from japan professor filkrat hiris from turkey professor gunto resis from germany professor satish kumar from open university uk professor rao from usa professor prashant sona from queensland university of australia and professor mikhail osheki from japan professor valery akincho from russia and professor rajan babu from a group leader and senior scientist max planck university of biochemistry germany so thank you one and all for accepting our invitation to deliver the valuable lectures and also being administrators in, in this particular time at this juncture it is also my pleasure to introduce our, our school so our school is known as school of advanced sciences which comprises of department of physics chemistry and mathematics and it is my pleasure to inform you that the department of physics and chemistry have been recognized by dst quiz for the past consecutive years and we have got the state of art facility to establish this facility with the able guidance from the dst and also with the able guidance of our respected uh, chancellor as well as the other core group members we are able to offer five important post graduate program with us so we are offering msc chemistry msc physics msc data science msc statistics and one uh, five year integrated post graduate program in mathematics so in addition to that we also offer one of the important flagship program of our um, school that is the phd program so we have more than 500 students doing and as well as pursuing their phd degree with us 
So this reflects the quality of our faculty members who are expertise in various fields of science and also the expertise in their academic activities. So with this brief introduction about the school, once again, I extend a warm welcome to all the speakers as well as the dignitaries on this uh, special inaugural function. And also I welcome the student participants from various countries and from the IT. Thank you once again for joining with us. Thank you for the opportunity given. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now I request Professor D. Rajan Babu, convener, to brief about the conference. Honorable Chancellor, respected Vice President, respected AVP Madam, Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, Registrar, Dean, School of Advanced Sciences, our Chief Guest, our Guest of Honor, other speakers, faculty, friends, and student participants. Welcome to, sorry, very good morning to all. This conference aims to bring together the researchers from different disciplines such as science, engineering, medicine, language processing in science, and supply chain management to engage and discuss practical examples and case studies that approach societal transformation through boundary breaking collaboration. The overall focus is on what we can learn from our collaborative experiences, case studies, and practices regarding wider societal transformation, methodological innovations, and the theoretical development we will specifically search for a change of domain in terms of spaces, practices, and learnings where transdisciplinary research and co-production play a crucial role. Innovation culture is a key factor in enhancing and sustaining the competitive advantage of an organization. Innovation culture encourages and supports innovation as well as creativity. Innovation culture has to deal with the, the need of past life cycle cycle innovations and uh, interdependence of research and related institutions. I'm happy that our chief guest of this function is going to deliver a lecture on creating a culture of innovation in our academic institution immediately after this inaugural function. This transdisciplinary conference is an initiative to provide an intellectual platform for renowned scientists from all over the world. Next three days, we are going to create an opportunity for the participants to explore and collaborate in transdisciplinary subjects such as COVID management, fiscal growth, energy harvesting, language processing in science, magnetism, supply chain management, and so on. We have invited 16 speakers from USA, Russia, UK, Italy, Germany, Japan, Australia, Turkey, and Singapore. 652 participants are attending this conference. We have received the abstract from Algeria, Belgium, Indonesia, Japan, Nigeria, Oman, Pakistan, Taiwan, Turkey, Mexico, Taipei, and India. Our Honorable Chancellor is going to release the book of abstract during this function. During this pandemic situation, we are organizing this three-day conference, but we are maintaining the social dis distance as per WHO advice. And also we are going to meet some of the internationally renowned scientists without any visa on Zoom platform. Let us pray the Almighty to conduct the in-person international conference in 2021. To conclude, if you do transdisciplinary research, you can get new energy. In physics, we say voltage in the current in the time, energy. That is VIT is nothing but energy. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir. May now request our beloved chancellor to release the book of abstracts. The chat to present the problem, mama. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the link will be there in the chat box, sir. Just you have to click the link. Is it okay? Uh, okay, yes, sir. sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Rajan Babu, sir, you just share it. Yes, 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, you can go to the next session. Meanwhile, sir will be doing it. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I humbly invite Dr. S. Narayanan, Pro Vice Chancellor, to enlighten us about VIT. Thank you, ma'am. Honorable Chancellor, our esteemed chief guests, our distinguished guests of honor, and other distinguished guests, learned colleagues, dear participants, very good morning to all of you. I'm extremely happy to participate in the inauguration of this wonderful virtual transdisciplinary conference. I'm delighted to note that many participants from across the globe, they are participating in this conference. I would like to utilize this opportunity to thank our chief guest, Professor Ram Gopal Rao, the director of the premier institute of the country, IIT Delhi, for joining us in spite of his busy schedule. Thank you, sir, for joining us. In fact, all IITs are role models to VIT. In fact, IIT Delhi, IIT Bombay, IIT Madras. We try to take all these premier institutes as a role models. It's a pleasure and it's an honor for all of us to introduce you today, sir. Thank you for sparing your valuable time with all of us, Professor Rao. And uh, I would also like to thank our uh, esteemed guest of honor, Professor Busope from Italy for joining us at our hour because it is too early in the morning for him. He has joined us. Thank you, Professor, for joining us. And also like to thank all the other distinguished speakers and the participants for joining us on behalf of the VIT administration. As it was pointed out by Dr. Rajan Babu, it will be a wonderful conference. And uh, Professor Ram Gopal Rao himself is going to talk about the innovation in the academic institution. And we are going to have multiple areas of research. And it will be a wonderful opportunity to all of you, all of us. I request all my student friends and the faculty to utilize this wonderful opportunity. I would also like to utilize this opportunity to appreciate the efforts put in by Dr. Rajan Babu and his team for organizing this conference. I thought I can give you a very brief overview about VIT for the benefit of the participants. You might be aware VIT was started as a small college in the year 1984 namely named as Bellur Engineering College. That time, we have been affiliated to University of Madras. We have started with three branches of engineering, civil, mechanical, electronics, and communication engineering, with an intake of 180 students. Our first batch of students, they have passed out from University of Madras in the year 1988 with flying colors. They have secured eight ranks out of nine ranks. And in the subsequent batches also, the students have done extremely well. Because of our academic excellence, Government of India has given us the deemed university status in the year 2001. Now, we have four campuses. Two campuses for our deemed university. Our main campus is at Velo, and our off campus is at Chennai. Then we have two state private university campuses, one at Amaravati, the capital of Andhra Pradesh, the other state private university campus at Bhopal, the capital of Madhya Pradesh. Today, we have more than 45,000 students in all four campuses. And we have got a very strong faculty. Most of our faculty are PhD holders from premier institutes like IIT. In fact, one of our colleagues is a student, a direct student of Professor Ram Gopal Rao. And we have got many students like that, many faculty like that in our faculty. And they are all doing well. The last 10 years, we are concentrating on research, increasing the number of publications. Now we are concentrating on the quality of publications also. We try to emulate the IIT Delhi, IIT Bombay, and IIT Madras as our models. And our faculty have been motivated to emulate these premier institutes models. And uh, our faculty are coping up very well in the last 10 years. And uh, if you look at our academic system, we call, we call it as fully flexible academic system, fully flexible credit system, FFCS, and it is followed in Western universities. We are following that system. We apply the concept. We ask the students to do the project. We also call it as curriculum for applied learning. And in the accreditation side, both at national level and international level, we are doing really well. If you look at the national accreditation, NAC accreditation, the last cycles, we have got the highest grade. Now, we are going for the fourth cycle of NAT accreditation. In the international accreditation also, we have got the prestigious ABIT accreditation from USA for many of our 
VTEC programs. Another major strength of VIT is placement. We have got very good placement. Almost all our engineering students, they are placed on campus. And the last five years, Government of India is ranking all the institutions in the country. It is called as NIR, National Institution Ranking Framework. In the last five years, we are, VIT is doing fairly well in NIR also. This year, our ranking among the engineering institutions is number 15. We are next to IITs and NITs. But if you look at the private players, we are number one in the last five years also. In the world ranking also, we are doing fairly well. QS ranking, THC ranking. And recently, Shankai has announced a ranking. And in the thousand, I mean, in the thousand uh, institutions in the Shankai ranking, only 15 institutions are there from India. I'm very proud to tell you that VAT is one among the 15 institutions, including IIC, IIT Delhi, IIT Bombay, and IIT Madras. We are one among the 15. And above all, we have been recognized as institution of eminence by Government of India last year. You might be aware, Government of India has recognized 10 public institutions. In the public institution category, IIT Delhi, IIT Bombay, IIT Madras, and so on, all other IITs also there. In private institutions, VAT is one of the institutions among the 10. The mandate given by the government is we got to become one of the top 500 universities in the next 10 years. But our vision, in fact, our chancellor is a highly visionary person. And our vision is we have to become one of the top 500 universities in the next five years. We are looking towards that. And we, we are very confident that we will be able to, we'll be able to reach that status very soon. With this, I would like to conclude by wishing the deliberations of this conference a grand success. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was very informative. Uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Ramesh Tamankar to introduce our guest of honor, Professor Guzapi Marcio, University of Salento, Italy. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Honorable Chancellor, sir, respected Vice President and uh, Assistant Vice President, Co-Chancellor, respected Chief Guest, Professor Ravi Ramagopal Rao, Director of IIT Delhi, invited speakers who have joined us from across the globe and other dignitaries in the inaugural session. It is my immense pleasure to invite our uh, guest of honor, Professor Giuseppe Morosio from uh, University of Salento, Italy. Professor Giuseppe Morosio is a full professor in physics department uh, in the University of Salento. He graduated in physics uh, with the magna cum laude in physics in, from Elise University, and uh, he got his PhD in 2004. Later on, he worked in uh, Roland Weizendanger's group in Hamburg, one of the leading uh, research group for uh, scanning tunneling microscopy, uh, where he mapped wave functions, uh, spatially uh, mapped wave functions. Uh, he was a coordinator of a SPIDME uh, project or proposal on molecular spintronics at the age of 28. He is a member of editorial board of various journals, to name a few, Journal of Sensors, MDPI Sensors, MDPI Micro Machines, and many more journals. He was a referee for prestigious journals like Science, Nature Nanotechnology, Physical Review Letters, Nano Letters, ACS Nano, and uh, JAX. From 2014 to 2019, he was a research delegate for the rector for the University of Salento taking responsibilities for fundraising, research evaluation uh, in the uh, European Research Night. Currently, he is heading the Omnics Research Group, which comprises researchers from physics to life sciences. The research directions include applications in electronics, spintronics, and magn magnonics to genomics, proteomics, and cellomics. Omnix Laboratories are the Italian node of the European infrastructure on magnetism. Uh, Marusio is an author of more than 130 applications and four patents, in addition to several invited comp contribution at international conferences, institutions, and PhD school. It is a pleasure to having you, Professor uh, Marusio. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And now I request our guest of honor, Professor Gashar. Uh, thank you, sir. Now I request our guest of honor, Professor Gusapi Murshio, to say a few words. Okay. 
Okay. So there was no no audio. Uh, good morning to uh, organizer, VIT staff, speakers, participants, and uh, everybody. I am uh, pleased uh, uh, to be here, and I thank the organizer for this invitation as a guest of honor uh, for this uh, inaugural function. And uh, I will be honored also to participate uh, uh, in this uh, virtual international transdisciplinary conference as invited speaker. So we are uh, we are facing a difficult period uh, for the world now due to the present COVID uh, pandemic uh, outbreak, uh, and the life of our dear is uh, is in danger. So we are forced to stay quite isolated uh, uh, to contain the outbreak. Uh, Italy was affected first and in India now, uh, but it is important to continue our cultural efforts toward advancing the knowledge frontiers on all disciplines to power progress in the world and uh, everyone's life. So it is of huge importance to have initiatives such as this uh, virtual, organized, uh, virtual International Transdisciplinary Conference can drive sharing of knowledge, uh, exchange of idea, brainstorming uh, on important topics, uh, such as the one already mentioned by Professor uh, uh, Babu, so magnetism, spintronics, uh, nanoelectronics, artificial intelligence, but also drug delivery and COVID uh, management. And uh, the Valore Institute of Technology is at the frontiers in these uh, in these efforts uh, as a top-ranking uh, university in in India, and so I am pleased to reinforce our uh, collaborations and uh, and connections. Uh, um, from um, the beginning of my of my activity, I had a strong connection with with India, and uh, I have several uh, Indian uh, researchers. Uh, and PhD students uh, working uh, in, uh, in my group of, in the frame of uh, European projects and other projects. And I'm pleased to communicate uh, today that we are uh, working uh, for uh, to sign a, a memorandum of understanding uh, among the Vellore Institute of Technology and the University of Salento to foster uh, interdisciplinary research and education on both sides and to favor also exchange visits uh, and uh, collaboration projects and uh, research. So I, I'm sure everyone will enjoy this uh, very interesting conference. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I wish everyone to, to enjoy this time. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for your uh, stimulating speech. Uh, now, I invite Dr. Tarun Gar to introduce our today's chief guest, Professor V. Ram Gopal, director of IIT Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it's my privilege and honor to have this opportunity to introduce our chief guest, Professor V. Ram Gopal Rao. Professor V. Ram Gopal Rao is currently the director of Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Before joining IIT Delhi as the director in April 2016, Dr. Rao served as a PK Kelkar Chair Professor for Nanotechnology in the Department of Electrical Engineering and as the Chief Investigator for the Center of Excellence in Nanoelectronics Project at IIT Bombay. Dr. Rao has over 450 research publications in the area of nanoscale devices and nanoelectronics and is an inventor of uh, 44 patents and patent applications, which include 15 issued US patents. 11 of his patents have been licensed to industries for commercialization. Professor Rao is a co-founder of two deep technology startups at IIT Bombay named NanoSniff and SoilSense, which are developing products of relevance to the society. Dr. Rao is a fellow of IEEE, a fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, and the Indian National Science Academy. Dr. Rao has been recognized with several awards and honors in the country and abroad. He is a recipient of Shanti Sarup Bhatnagar Prize in Engineering Sciences, and Infosys Prize as well. Dr. Rao has received the Swan Jayanti Fellowship Award from the Department of Science and Technology. He has also received IBM Faculty Award, Best Research Award from Intel Asia Academic Forum, Techno Mentor Award from the Indian Semiconductor Association, DASRC Outstanding Research Investigator Award, NASI Reliance Platinum Jubilee Award, JC Bose National Fellowship, 
professor cnr rao national nano science award vasvik award and the excellence research award from iit bombay professor rao was an editor for the ieee transaction on electron devices uh, during 20 uh, 2003 to 2012 and for the cmos devices and technology area and currently he serves as on the editorial advisory board of acs nano letters a leading international journal in the area of nanotechnology Uh, he is a distinguished lecturer at IEEE Electron Devices Society and interacts closely with many semiconductor industry both in India and abroad. Dr. Rao has uh, served as the chairman IEEE APED Bombay chapter and as a vice chairman IEEE Asia Pacific regions chapters and subcommittee for two terms. He was the first elected chairman for the India section uh, American Nano Society during 2013-2015. So on behalf of organizing committee I would like to thank you professor Rao for accepting our invitation for being chief guest and sparing your valuable time from your busy session thank you very much thank you sir i take this opportunity in welcoming our today's chief guest professor V Ram Gopal Rao to deliver the inaugural address please sir okay thank you let me share my presentation so i hope you are able to see my presentation is it okay? yes yes it's visible thank you so thanks a lot uh, chancellor and uh, all of you who are uh, here listening to my talk i am honored to be invited for this and uh, of course i have many friends in vit including my students so I, I visited VIT many times, and I consider VIT as one of the good institutions in the country. And and you are definitely doing well now that you are an institution of eminence. I think there are a lot more expectations from VIT, and uh, I think we're all, you know, in a way, trying to work with each other and see how we can help each other. Thank you very much. So my talk, uh, I, I have how much time do I have uh, for this talk? Thirty minutes. minutes. Thirty minutes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so my talk is about creating a culture of innovation in our academic institution. This is uh, this has been one of the concerns of government of India. In fact, uh, everybody is saying you are producing high quality students, and you also seem to be doing research in terms of publishing papers and all that. But but what else? You know, what else can you do for the country? In what way is uh, is uh, the country getting benefited? Uh, out of your research activities i think that is where we are all trying to answer questions and you know that is what i will try to address i have you know all this is i collaborate with a large number of institutions all over the world including industries and i also you know all this work is anyway done by my students at the technical part of the work that i am presenting today and uh, i collaborate uh, across the disciplines you know in a major way that way so and uh, the current status of indian rnd if you look at so india current india is doing very well when it comes to publishing papers we are ranked third in the world in terms of research output. excuse me sir sorry for the interruption yeah, yeah. sir Please. this is the inaugural function we have scheduled it for 45 minutes so followed by this our chancellor will be addressing us since he is having the meeting the your okay. session will be followed by this sir so just two to three minutes you can address the participants sir. why is the inaugural session yes sir. Thank you. Anyway, I think uh, I, I'm since I'm going to talk for half an hour, so I don't have much to say. I think uh, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, I mean, like I said, uh, I know VIT very well. You are doing very well. I think uh, uh, good to be participating in this event. Thank you. I will come back and give this talk. Thank you very much, sir. I'm very sorry. Thank you, sir. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure in inviting our honorable chancellor to deliver the presidential address uh, am i audible yes sir yes sir our, our chief guest of today professor ram gopal rao director iit delhi our guest of honor professor scp marusio from university of salento italy um, Dr. Mary Sarrell, the Dean, Professor Narayanan, our uh, Provost Chancellor, Dr. Anil Vidhi, Dr. Rajan Babu, Dr. Ramesh Babu, Dr. Tarun Gurg, Dr. Sanjil Nadan, other professors in the School of Advanced Sciences, 
our guests who join from various parts of the globe and various parts of India, very good morning to you. Uh, I thank the chief guest for uh, accepting our invitation to be here today. Um, uh, yeah, I went through his uh, biography. Uh, he is more a scientist than a professor. He has more than 430 publica 50 publications and uh, 44 patents, out of which 11 have already been commercialized. I think he will be a model to all of our uh, researchers and professors. And uh, I thank the guest of honor. I think it must be early morning in Italy. And uh, he has joined in spite of the uh, odd time. I thank him and uh, uh, I have never visited that uh, part of uh, Italy. I have been to Italy 50 years ago as a member of parliament. Afterwards, I got, uh, I didn't have an opportunity to visit. I hope in the future, I'll go and visit him, our professor. Uh, it uh, is really happy that this uh, School of Advanced Sciences has organized this conference, virtual conference on transdisciplinary uh, subjects. Keeping updated on the latest trends in transdisciplinary subject across a wide range of research disciplines can be an intimidating task. Realizing this imperative, the Department of Physics School of Advanced Sciences is organizing this conference uh, 26th to 28th of August. It's a well-known fact that our society has been facing critical issues in the development owing to various challenges. Nowadays, there have been a new attempts to address the various societal issues through transdisciplinary research, which integrates the knowledge and the expertise from a variety of disciplines, including science, engineering, medicine, technology, business, etc. Uh, during this pandemic period, the entire world is facing a problem, not only for survival, but also for economic development, where it has uh, hit us badly. VIT has been a very active in pursuing cutting edge research in various domains of knowledge. Our schools and research centers are working relentlessly to find solutions to several research problems. And the School of Advanced Sciences at VIT is in the forefront of research contributions. I, I would like to inform our guests today that uh, last four or five years, the Scopus Index publications, we have been uh, ranked as number one. The only problem is we should uh, improve our patents, even though publications we are leading. Patents, uh, we should have more on the, again, uh, like uh, Ram Gopal Rao, so we should be able to commercialize where he is the model to us. Everyone understands the importance of research and most of the countries are investing huge amounts of money in research and they have been trying to find out, find the vaccine for COVID-19. It is good that this conference, some of the speakers and participants are going to discuss their findings on this topic also. As far as research is concerned, I think uh, we will have to uh, more, uh, spend more uh, as a country um, in fact, uh, we were told that uh, we are doing well in the search. In spite of it, that we spend only less than 1% of the GDP on research. It is time now that we encourage more research scholars and spend more money on research. It is my desire that this conference should also contribute to the discovery of some solution to the problem that we are facing. I'm happy to note that 16 speakers from all over the world uh, some kind of, including countries from USA, Russia, UK, Japan, Italy, Australia, Germany, Turkey, and Singapore are taking part in this virtual conference. I appreciate that 61 participants were going to present their papers uh, and I express greetings to all the 652 registered participants who are going to benefit from the knowledge and expertise of the globally renowned scientists presentations during the three-day conference. Once again, I thank our chief guest and guest of honor for spending their valuable time to take part in this conference and enlighten the participants. I hope all of you will enjoy the deliberations on the range of transdisciplinary subjects during these three days. My best wishes to one and all. Thank you very much.
Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for your wonderful speech. Uh, the quality of your leadership is an inspiration to us. Uh, thank you so much for your constant support and encouragement as always. Thank you. May I now request Dr. K. Senthil Nadan, Head of the Department Physics, to convey the vote of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Honorable Chancellor, respected Vice President, respected Assistant Vice President, our most invited guests, Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, Registrar, dignitaries, faculty members, students, ladies and gentlemen. Very good morning to all of you. I deem it a great honor and privilege to get an opportunity to propose a vote of thanks on this memorable occasion. We are grateful to our beloved Chancellor, respected Vice President, and respected Assistant Vice President for having granted to conduct this mega virtual international transfer conference, VITC 2020. I, on behalf of VIT, entire fraternity of VIT, and on my own behalf, convey deep regards and hearty thanks to the Chief Guest, Professor V. Ram Gopal Rao, Director, IIT Delhi, and Guest of Honor, Professor Gushipe Marasio, University of Salanto, Italy, for accepting our invitation and gracing the inaugural ceremony despite their busy schedule. Besides, we also thank the distinguished speakers for joining us the inaugural session. I owe special gratitude to Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, and Register for their valuable contribution, guidance, and encouragement in all our efforts. We record our sincere gratitude to our Dean, Professor A. Mary Sarrell, for her valuable inputs, constant moral support, and continuous help throughout the program. We are also thankful to deans of various schools and the heads of various departments for their involvements. A mega event like this cannot happen overnight. The wheels start rolling weeks ago. It requires planning and a bird's eye for details. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues who know their job and are result-oriented. Yes, my special and hearty thanks go to my faculty colleagues and staff members, especially who involved in this event for their support, dedication, teamwork, and untiring efforts. They all work smilingly shoulder to shoulder to make this VITC 2020 conference a grand success. We also thank Director Event Management, Professor A. Ruben Kumar and his team, especially Mr. Sudan Raj for their help. Further, we also thank CPS Manager, Mr. CM Mohan Kumar and his team, especially Mr. K. Gopi and Mr. D. Jevanesan for their wonderful technical support. We also record our sincere thanks to Dr. K. Adi Narayanan, University Librarian, for getting us EISBN number for the Book of Abstracts. Once again, I thank you all for your kind cooperation, attention, and patience. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you all for your presence in our inaugural function of uh, virtual international transdisciplinary conference. Uh, thank you, one and all. Um, our uh, sincere apologies to Dr. Ramakopal uh, Rao uh, for a bit miscommunication during the inaugural session, sir. Very sorry for that. Thank you, Professor Rao. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So once again, thank you so much for the wonderful presence. I would like to thank our Chancellor, sir, as well as our Pro Vice Chancellor, sir. Now we are going to the first session of the conference. Thank you so much, sir. You can sign off, sir. Thank you so much. Now, it's my pleasure to invite our respected uh, chief guest, Professor V. Ram Gopal Rao, to give his uh, talk on the latest innovations, uh, which is applicable to the multidisciplinary research. So he's going to present a talk on creating a culture of innovation in our academic institutions, which is the need of the day. Thank you so much, sir. I invite you to uh, speak to us on this uh, particular day, the first day of the conference. Thank you so much, sir. It's over to you now. Thank you. Uh, so I understand I still have 30 minutes, right? That's yes, sir. Yes, you have 30 yeah. minutes and 15 minutes interaction. Okay. So I, as I was saying, I, of course, all my students and my collaborators, I would uh, acknowledge here. And the current status of R&D, as I was mentioning, India is currently ranked third in terms in the world in terms of research output. This is from the recent uh, NRF, uh, the National Research Foundation of, of the US. Um, and uh, I think, you know, in terms of publications, we are doing very well. Our share is still small, but, uh, but we are growing. In fact, India is growing at 14% in terms of scientific publications per year. 
as compared to the world average of uh, 4%. So that way we are one of the fastest growing countries uh, in terms of even the research output. And uh, we, as uh, even the Chancellor Vishwanathan, Professor Vishwanathan mentioned, we are not spending enough money in the country as a percentage of GDP, our, our contribution, our financial inputs to the, to the higher educational or research ecosystem, I think needs a lot more improvement, but, uh, but, but still in terms of per dollar spent, you know, Indians write more papers than anybody else. I think uh, you know, from that point of view also, we are doing very well. Uh, give more money, we can write more papers that has become a norm in all of our academic institutions, so which is also good in a way. I think we are that way ranked number one in that. I think we, we do, you know, best use of uh, the funds given to us when it comes to writing papers. Even in certain areas of nanotechnology, India has been ranked third for almost like a decade now. And we have overtaken many other countries in the last decade. And uh, we are at the third position consistently after China, US comes, uh, comes India. So, but our biggest challenge is from, from funding, we are able to, uh, you know, generate knowledge. But our challenge is now from the knowledge, uh, can, we con can we create wealth? So that is the translation research part of it, the knowledge into wealth, that translation we are, we are sorely lacking right now. Though there are a lot of efforts being done, all of us are filing enough patents, but as you know, the commercialization of these patents is still an issue in all of our institutions. We have now put in place proper mechanisms for filing patents. So therefore we are filing more and more patents at IIT Delhi, for example, four years ago, we were filing 10, 15 patents per year. In 2019, we filed 153 patents. And in 2020, we will file more than 200 patents. So therefore the number of patents are increasing because now there are better processes in place you know, for, for, the, for the filing of patents. But the commercialization aspect is where we are all now trying to you know, put in place proper mechanisms again. For example, IIT Delhi last year in 2019, for the first time crossed one crore mark in terms of patent licensing fee. And uh, so from the licensing of our patents, we earned about a crore. This year we are hoping, uh, you know, because of COVID related technologies, which have got commercialized in a big way from IIT Delhi, we are hoping that we will earn about, uh, you know, a couple of crores or rather uh, at least three crores this year from the patent licensing fee. I think, you know, so, but that is a process that we need to, you know, start uh, uh, strengthen further start to strengthen further and that is where as academic institutions we are all struggling. If you look at any academic institution whether it is VIT or IIT or MIT I think there are you know education is our primary focus our our job is to disseminate the knowledge you know to a large cross-section of students and uh, make them the, the leaders in their fields that is our number one priority. Then comes the knowledge generation that is you generate new knowledge of course, education is all about disseminating the knowledge which is available, but, uh, but we also need to new, generate new knowledge in academic institutions. Therefore, R&D has become as important as education. In all of our institutions now, we have more postgraduate students than undergraduate students. At IIT Delhi, for example, 60% of our students are postgraduate and only 40% are undergraduate. So this is one transition that has taken place in the last 10 years now. And uh, so that is the second thing. But this innovation has got added recently to our mandate. Now people are no longer happy if we show them a list of publications. They're saying, of course you are publishing well, but what next? What has come out of all your publications? So, so that is a question now the society is asking more and more, the funding agencies are asking more and more, even the government is asking more and more. So therefore, all of us are now looking at innovation in a, in a major way. And when you talk about innovation, how do you convert the knowledge you generate into innovation? What is innovation? Innovation is using this knowledge to impact the society. I think finally, innovation is inception to impact. So you identify a problem and you provide a solution to that problem. And that problem needs to become realistic, needs to be used by people. And you are at the end of the day solving a problem. So while knowledge generates, you know, all the, all the, all whatever you require to solve a problem, but application of that knowledge to solve a problem is what is innovation. And there, you know, the relevance and delivery become very important. So while we talk about research and development all the time, 
but if you want to convert this knowledge into innovation your your knowledge needs to be relevant to the society that you are in i can model air quality in london right there are you know i can if i if i am a scientist i can look at uh, all the data and then start to model air quality in london but with that i cannot create a startup i cannot you know impact the uh, air quality in delhi that knowledge will help me but it will not impact the society around me that is where the relevance becomes important so all that knowledge if i can apply to the delhi problem and if i can solve the air quality problem in delhi that for me and is an innovation so that is what we need to be doing in fact as a, we have all been hearing while science is global the technology needs to be local i think the so that is where the, our institutions will be better known that is where we will be regarded as the world's best therefore relevance is one very important thing and the delivery is also important while there is so much of knowledge that exists in academia how much of it is getting delivered to the society how much of it is being used to solve a problem so therefore to me you know the r and d now the new definition of r and d for us if we ever want to be you know making and making a innovation as our uh, as our primary engine of growth you know it has to be relevance and delivery so the delivery thing fortunately now in india the startups are playing a very big role you know i am seeing that at iit delhi at least there are 100 startups now and uh, and many of these startups are are indeed now you know doing very well many of them are in the deep tech space earlier the only way i could deliver a, a solution to the to the society was by interacting with industries now since there were hardly any industries in the manufacturing space that process never really got strengthened lot of knowledge were getting generated but the industry was never keen to take it up and and uh, and deliver anything to the society as a result you know all of them worked as silos and nothing much really changed in the society despite academia providing or or, or doing lot of uh, lot of research on many of those problems but now the startup thing is changing in a big way i will also show you even during the covid time through one of my slides later that how this has in really helped us to take our solutions to the society in such a short time in a matter of 3 months 4 months you know we have been able to deliver these solutions to society that is only possible or that has been possible because of the energy and drive the startup uh, brought to the entire academic ecosystem so i think this is something that we need to strengthen further and therefore bring make your research relevant to the problems around you and india has big markets you know there are a billion people waiting to uh, you know lap them up once you have a solution to their problem and the delivery to startups is where i see the new future for india and also a new financial model for our academic institutions this taking you know some money from government and running institutions i think you know 10 years from now 20 years from now will be passe and you will be asked to become self sufficient how do we become self sufficient in a country like india you cannot keep on charging higher tuition fee in a government systems it won't work because of the equity and other issues that we need to live with you know we we cannot say that unless you put money on the table you will not get admission the only way to enter iit is is to clear an exam after you clear the exam no one should be able to ask any further questions on whether you can pay the fee or not pay the fee so therefore then in the new financial model for institutions even the startup equity will become very important you know can iits can institutions invest in the startups and some of these startups becoming big enough like uh, you know what india has produced all these unicorns like flipkart snap deals and, and and many of these companies which are more in the e-commerce space which is fine but even in the technology space if some of these companies become big out of these institutions the 5% or 4% equity you hold in these companies you know that will run your institutions for decades i think that is a financial model we are all looking at and even the technology licensing while it is only you know 1 crore 2 crore kind of a money we are all earning from technology licensing how do we take it to 50 crores or 100 crores kind of a thing just yesterday i was looking at mit's you know how much mit earned the i am talking of massachusetts institute of technology how much mit earned in 2019 from the from the technology licensing activity was about 50 million dollars that's a kind of a money mit earned uh, in uh, in uh, 2019 which is still a small fraction i mean if for an mit kind of an institution compared to their budgets all the money they made out of technology licensing was about 50 million dollars and uh, but the startup equity you know which which we are all beginning to hold now if you value at that equity 
that can become another big trigger you know for uh, for uh, sustainability of our institutions that is one thing which we are very consciously looking at you know at iit delhi and i am confident that with the kind of emphasis we are laying on the startups in the in the institute now and now that we are beginning to invest in these startups even in terms of real money i have a feeling you know this will become a big thing for the for all of us in the in the near future for this you know one thing needs to change the one thing that needs to change is how do we choose research problems in academia in india particularly when 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 you know our phd students join us when they come to the faculty members saying that you know i want to work with you and i want to do my phd with you what is the first thing that we do we send the student to the library right that's the first way you know the any research problem starts every thesis in the country starts with a literature review and then student goes to library looks at 100 papers and comes back to the faculty members saying that you know sir i have read these papers this is done this is done this is not done can i work on it and depending on the facilities the faculty members expertise the the student decides the topic writes more papers and these papers go back to library so many of our research problems start with library and end with library they many of them don't even see the light of the day and many of them don't even get cited i think that is the the worrying part of it so therefore how do you choose research problems uh, in academia that fundamentally needs to change i have four ways you know one needs to choose the one can choose the research problems one is through industry interactions so if you interact more closely with industries industries have tons of problems you go to maruti you go to you know uh, iocl you go to any uh, company in the country they all have you know problems uh, in which they are facing so if you can interact more and more with industry that is where you can find some of your good problems from when i was for example you know working out, outside the country you know every week some industry would come and say that you know we have this problem i am doing this processing there is an yield problem or i am fabricating this device it behaving it's behaving very weird i am not able to explain can you you know help me those were the problems that were posed to us and that is how most of our research you know became very relevant to the industry and these were also cutting edge because these were all the big industries and and they were already at the leading edge of their own uh, Uh, domains and as a result you got problems which nobody else had as a result you know we became in a way those institutions became world leaders in uh, in uh, starting new uh, research directions and all of that so therefore this interaction with industry is going to be very very important very very important for us you know if we ever need to become relevant the other way to you know look for problems in a country like india is but you can say you know in industry but there are no not many industries they are all using with out they are all working with outdated technologies but there are still some good industries which you can interact with but the other way is to find problems from the society just observe what are the things in the society and uh, you know india has all the problems of the world if you are looking for a problem you don't have to go to a conference in america to find a problem you just look around you 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 go to a rural area you will find in the rural area from sanitation to agriculture everything is a research problem but that is where our humanities and social sciences departments need to become you know important for us because they are the ones who need to decipher these problems in the society and present them to the engineers and say that you no know, this is a problem that exists with our agriculture if you can find a, a solution to this through your technologies you know you can improve the the, the livelihood of these farmers i think those kind of uh, questions need to be Uh, need to be posed by the humanities faculty and the solutions also need to be posed to the engineers from 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 these humanities departments so from that point of view strengthening our humanities departments making them connect with the society is very important otherwise you leave a humanities person you know to himself or herself they will only be you know sitting in their rooms and and only writing uh, you know books and chapters and all of that which again is not going to solve much for an engineering institution so our humanities departments need to at least become our windows to the society from there you can find tons of good problems to work on so that is one thing which we are also doing the third thing is as i was saying the library thing so that you you know many 70 to 100% of problems in an institution now in some institutions 100% of problems basically come out of library in some of our institutions now at least 70% of problems still come from library but 30% are coming from other you know kind of sources and all of that and that percentage therefore needs to go the percentage of you know each one of these other quadrants needs to needs to uh, go up as compared to what we are choosing as 
problems from library. Now the interactions with the strategic agencies, for example, you know, DRDO, ISRO, DAE, Indian Council for Agricultural Research, there are tons of problems they have. And uh, that is again where you can, if you are able to interact with these security agencies, interact with the defense establishments, you can again get lots of problems. This is one thing which we did successfully at IIT Delhi about two and a half years ago, we joined hands with DRDO. Now there are at least 150 crore worth projects which are ongoing at IIT Delhi. About 100 faculty members at IIT Delhi are closely working with DRDO on the, on the future defense technologies. And, and that is again a major source of uh, you know, satisfaction because what you do now can benefit you know, some of these strategic agencies very directly. Therefore, I think the way we choose problems, the more, the more and more we move away from these picking from the libraries uh, as a source of finding problems, the better it will be for our institutions, the better it will, the more relevant it will become. And then through startups, you can anyway deliver these solutions and a lot of great things can happen. So therefore, this is one thing that we need to change, uh, you know, which will change the character of our institutions. And, and that is where we need to put all our, all our efforts on. And even the National Research Foundation is also trying to do that, which the, the government of India has announced it as part of the new education policy. Otherwise, even our funding agencies, there is not a single funding agency which gives you funds, which also gives you a problem. Very often when you go for research funding to any of the Indian agencies, you go with your own problem. And where did you get that problem from? You, know, you got it mostly from library and all of that. So, and then they fund your research and that's a vicious cycle that we have gotten ourselves in. And there is no agency which says that this is a problem that I want you to solve and here is the money. And that we still don't have a single agency. The ministries have tons of problems in Delhi, but they don't have a proper mechanism to interact with uh, academic institutions. And the only place where you get funded today is the Department of Science and Technology, you know, for most of the research that we do in academia. But DST doesn't have its own problem. They don't collect problems from ministries and give it to us. They, we go with our problems and get funds from them. So this is something which I am hoping the new education policy will address uh, and that is what might make things better. To me, you know, our institutions need to become these idea factories. What are these idea factories? When do we become idea factories? Only when we bring unlike minds together. What are unlike minds? We need to bring people from different cultural backgrounds together. That is again where the joint degree programs, international students, international faculty. In IITs now, we are aggressively recruiting international faculty. In fact, you know, we every month we are recruiting at least one international faculty member because we realize that you know the diversity is very important in our educational institutions. India is a diverse country, but unfortunately, all our states follow the same CBSC curriculum, same you know academic curriculum in the schools. All our students take the same examinations. So I think we we basically kill kill that diversity by make by subjecting all of them to go through one single education process in the country. Though India culturally is very diverse, but in terms of educational, in terms of learning, in terms of thinking, we have we have lost a lot of that diversity. We have conditioned all children to think exactly alike, whether they come from Velur or whether they come from Jammu Kashmir. That is one challenge, you know, which we have uh, despite India being such a diverse country. But that is where international factors faculty, international students are important for our institutions at IIT Delhi. We are aggressively pursuing this. And interdisciplinary training, what this conference is all about, I think this is again where uh, we need to bring people together. For example, at IIT Delhi, All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi is our neighbor. So now, but we were not interacting enough with them. In the last three years, for example, we started at least 100 new projects between IIT Delhi and All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And I can tell you that is doing wonders now because when medical doctors and engineers interact with each other, there are lots of interesting things they can do. The same thing we did with the Indian Council for Agricultural Research, the same thing we did uh, you know, through a school of info artificial intelligence. So this is bringing people with different disciplinary trainings together. That is again where we have put a lot of emphasis at IIT Delhi and also bringing people with different attitudes together. That is where industries and academia working becomes very important because I think the industry people come with a completely different attitude. They ask different kinds of questions. That is again very important to make our institutions unlike in, 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 uh, in, with respect to creativity. Therefore, creativity will happen when unlike minds work together. 
and that is where the to me the unlike minds are all of these we need to emphasize in our academic institutions and have structured programs they're saying that you collaborate with each other that is not going to do much at iit delhi we started a program called faculty interdisciplinary research program and we said that if two faculty members from two different departments or centers work together institute provides them the seed grant and with that seed grant they can start the initial activity on two years they need to go out and get external funding so we funded uh, at least 100 projects under the faculty interdisciplinary research program now many of those 100 teams now have gone out got more funding so iit delhi research funding has grown four times in the last four years because of this interdisciplinary research activity which we encourage through internal seed funding therefore all of these need to be structured programs just seeing you know telling people telling our faculty you know work with each other is not going to motivate anybody to work with each other and unless you put in some money put where put your mouth where the money is or put your money where the mouth is i think that is where uh, you know great things can happen in terms of many of these collaboration opportunities so i think you know at iit delhi we have these four eyes which is what we have chosen interdisciplinary research internationalization industry connect and which are all leading towards the innovation so that is where uh, we have multiple programs now to encourage our faculty and students and if you ask me you know in terms of technologies so what are the technologies that uh, that are going to impact our life in the next uh, let's say decade or two to me there are five technologies which is our information technology biotechnology nanotechnology cognitive technology and quantum technology i think all over lives you know we will be working with one of these platform these are not verticals these are more like platform technologies each of these technology can have applications from agriculture to textile to you know anything that you name and uh, india has uh, started to you know embrace information technology in a major way india has actually done very well you know if you look at uh, 2019 saudi arabia crude oil exports were in 2019 were 133.6 billion us dollars india's it exports were 137 billion dollars so now whereas crude oil is a perishable thing you know it is not a renewable kind of a thing but whereas it you know it's all the brain power so i think with our brain power we are actually exporting as much as what saudi arabia is exporting out of its oil reserves i think that's a good sign india is doing very well you know uh, in the it field and we are the office of the world is is a you know reason why uh, you know we we should all be happy about uh, the contributions of india to the it space even in biotechnology india has done very well if you look at biotechnology we are the largest provider of generic drugs globally 50% of global vaccines are manufactured in india 40% of generic drugs in the us are are manufactured in india every second medicine sold in the us is manufactured in india every fourth medicine sold in the uk is manufactured in india so even in biotechnology space india is doing very well when it comes to nanotechnology india currently is ranked third in the world in terms of knowledge generation this is where we need to capture the market in the next decade this knowledge now needs to become a commodity this knowledge is going to become wealth and that is where india needs to position itself you know uh, and then uh, pitch for you know entering into these markets which are opened because of nanotechnology the cognitive technology is another space where india has put in lot of efforts now lot of money is becoming available for this and india is actually ranked fifth in terms of uh, citation so we are uh, doing very well in terms of research research impact but again you know it's a very vast area huge markets and that is where we need to be able to translate our knowledge into wealth the final thing is the quantum technology india has a very strong tradition of basic research quantum technology is all about the basic research and applying it to uh, again multiple sectors and that is again where india needs to capture you know the 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 knowledge space as well as the commercial space and and therefore these are the five platform technologies where you will see you know a lot happening and while we have done very well in the first two in terms of capturing the markets but we need to be also able to do very well in the the remaining three because these three are going to decide our next three decades of, uh, of how the, the 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 world markets are going to shape up and uh, so having said that i will you know just give you in the next 5 uh, minutes or so you know uh, nanotechnology which is where i work in you know how we have been working on nanotechnology and how we have been uh, able to uh, you know actually 
produce products out of it you know you can apply nanotechnology to all of these domains whether it is security energy agriculture you know all of these areas can benefit from nanotechnology so in, i am a faculty member first and then you know whatever i am later so as a faculty member i started to work more in in multidisciplinary groups and lead many of these multidisciplinary groups groups at iit bombay and even now i have interactions with uh, between iit bombay and delhi where some of many of my students are working with each other with faculty from at least four or five different departments and centers so we wanted to develop a low cost cardiac diagnostic system we built a very sensitive platform we took a complete system level view so we said you know we don't want to end up only writing papers while you need to write papers file patents because at the end of the day phd students are involved so therefore what problem you choose must be research wise challenging enough that you can write good papers in top journal so so therefore we chose this uh, low cost cardiac diagnostic system as a complete system development uh, as part of one of our funded projects and then we developed a platform for for detecting uh, some of these proteins in the blood like the cardiac markers like troponin myoglobin using a polymer based nano cantilever platform nano mechanical cantilever platform so we did lot of innovation and we were able to use that innovation to actually build a complete product and in incubate a company nano sniff technologies for taking this to the market and then we used the same platform to do explosive detection so we built actually an xniff platform which is for detecting explosives in the vapor phase again this you know we have been interacting with many strategic agencies for that and we also were able to for example uh, develop a nems platform uh, for explosive detection these are all the nano mechanical switches for detecting explosives and here again we we are we have a product now through a company nano sniffer we have been able to commercialize this product nano sniffer is now commercially available it's a completely disruptive technology for explosive detection which is uh, now marketed by nano sniff technologies and uh, we also now uh, are working on iot nodes for explosive detection you know idea is to develop these iot nodes and then install them in the buses and trains for uh, for preventing any terrorist attacks in these places so lot of work we have done and to power these iot nodes in buses we we have worked on uh, piezoelectric materials many of them are lead free piezoelectric materials in fact we interacted with industries to develop these lead free piezoelectric materials we hold a us patent on this and we also wrote some very high impact factor papers on uh, on the lead free piezoelectric materials this particular journal for example is a uh, impact factor above 13 and we have multiple such papers now in uh, high impact factor journals and but but why did we work in this area because we wanted to develop that iot node for explosive detection and then put them in the buses and trains and we wanted these iot nodes to generate power from the vibrations and that is why we got into this area and uh, and now we are working on the agricultural sensors we again uh, have been working with uh, closely with government of india various agencies because government of india now wants farmers to to uh, to be able to measure all of these micro and macro nutrients in the soil and uh, that is where we are developing sensors for for all these micro and macro nutrients between iit delhi and iit bombay there is a project now where we are working on four different kinds of prototypes for agricultural applications and uh, we have already been successful in developing some of these uh, sensors and uh, some of them are are currently commercialized we started a company soil sense technologies so this company is already able to commercialize many of these sensors that we have worked in the laboratory and they they are uh, now able to show that on for a variety of crops by using these sensor nodes you can reduce water usage your, your water usage can come down by 26.5% while your yield can grow grow by 7.5% for the green gram and similarly 66% saving in electricity and 33% saving in water reduction in manpower for a variety of farms and gardens so we are now working with multiple agencies uh, in order to you know make them uh, take them to the farmers many farmers are already using many of these technologies right now we are uh, here uh, the soil sense is actually the first agriculture company so we now have multiple such prototypes and using startups we are taking them to the market nano sniff is one of the companies which is now successful and we have the second company soil sense technologies which is working with all of these uh, uh, all of these industries now to take these technologies to the farmer through an innovative business model 
in addition to the technology inputs and uh, so we have prototype facilities so the and even during the covid time for example i think the emphasizing startups in our campuses is very very important at iit delhi for example in the last four months we have been able to put out all of these technologies uh, in the market or in the society mainly through our startups so the for example we have the world's cheapest rt pcr kit which has come out of iit delhi this has been licensed to 10 industries and uh, now they are, we can we are able to add 2 million test kits per month uh, rt pcr kits per month using this technology so this has come out of iit delhi and commercialized to a startup and similarly multiple ppes you know the the uh, the protective equipment all of them have come out of our startups now iit delhi startups have put out at least you now something like 40 lakh 4 million uh, ppes in the market and 40% of these ppes are now getting exported because they all have been tested certified by standard agency so this is therefore i think that is a way, way to do that multidisciplinary teams choosing the right problem and using startups as a vehicle to put these technologies out into the market i think these are the ways for us to go ahead like i said our institutions need to become uh, these idea factories and that is when lot of great things will happen and and for that you need to have your faculty also you know contribute to these activities if faculty members only do research and expecting students to become entrepreneurs is not going to happen so at iit delhi we also started a program called fire fire is faculty innovation and research driven entrepreneurship under this if a faculty member says out of my technology i want to start a company institute gives them leave three years of leave of which the first year they can get their full salary we give faculty members 50 lakh rupees as a grant to to do the translation research so we are encouraging our faculty to become entrepreneurs so that their phd students and other students can also join hands and and uh, and get into this deep tech innovation space so i think you know this is how uh, lakshmi and saraswati need to come together you know as long as we see the lakshmi and saraswati are exclusive to each other uh, we will never be able to you know commercialize any of the research that is happening out of uh, our academic institution so the so to me you know the schemes to nurture innovation the schemes to uh, encourage faculty members to become entrepreneurs with proper conflict of interest policies and all of that in place which is what we have done and now there are at least 100 companies in iit and they are all helping us in take uh, all the innovations coming out of iit delhi from to the society i think you know this is the way in my opinion to to move forward i would uh, stop here and thank you very much for your attention Yes, yeah, so thank you very much for your wonderful talk. It covered almost all the topic what we have given as a transdisciplinary approach. I would like to address some of the questions uh, which have been um, uh, posted in the chat box. So one student have asked how students with a startup idea should approach investors. it has been seen that many of the ideas could not flourish because of not finding good investments while these ideas could be useful to the society so how to approach the startups that is what his question is that's a good point i think there are many videos on the web you know the pitching how do you pitch it to the to the investors first of all you need a sound idea but i would also you know suggest that uh, government of india has many schemes now to fund startups there are multiple schemes of government of india at the initial stages at the early stages of a startup it is not a good idea to go to a private investor if you do that what happens is the equity dilution will happen very early because companies are valued very low when they are just started uh, i think that is not the right time to go to a private investor for investment because then that investor will say give me 50% of your company for that small bit of money i will give and that is not going to you know lead leave any motivation to the to the innovators to further work on the product so therefore initial phase we should use government funding and there are multiple avenues to get government funding mighty ministry of electronics has one department of biotechnology has one and almost all ministries are now beginning to fund startups i think uh, my advice is to go to government first use this the government grants and the, mature the technology and then you go to an investor and then look for funding so it needs to be done that way Thank you, sir. So there is one more question from the faculty side. 
in all the technologically developed countries the science communications to public is done successfully india seems to be not doing well in this front how to improve our science communication to public very good point in fact department of science and technology has an entire grant scheme to encourage scientists to become communicators meaning communicate their research to the public there is a program called ausar you should go to the dst website look at awsar and that is a program where you can get money to you know uh, prepare videos out of your research for general public and there is a uh, you know support uh, scheme now there is a way to support research from dst one should make use of it a lot of lot more is happening we are all now communicating more if you see our social media post and all of that i think we have all become active now in communicating what is happening which is important i think uh, i agree with that uh, we were uh, you know these are all cultural issues in india we have always been told that do great work but you know but don't talk much about yourself kind of a thing i think we have all grown up uh, with that kind of a culture we have also been told that you know if you are doing academic kind of a thing keep money out of it you know you either go after money you are go after knowledge you never said that you can you can do both you know we so it is all cultural issues which will take some more time but slowly we are overcoming them and and things are looking better now i would say with the permission of chair uh, can i ask a question with the permission of chair yes yes, is, uh, yeah. yes. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, good morning sir uh, my name is vijay rahavan uh, from the department of chemistry uh, just fix coordinates uh, i am from the same school of professor ramanan and professor ganguli in iit delhi uh, i am here with 18 years at vit my question is uh, you talked about industry academia uh, problems uh, nice and uh, you demonstrated from your side itself but what about a pg program masters program being sponsored by industry fully is it happening in the country like in western world they are doing much on this uh, sponsored programs in fact we tried last year to uh, in a way you know revive our masters programs with more industry funding and all of that uh, but uh, it's still a challenge iit delhi for example runs one masters program which is entirely funded by industries we don't use any mhrd fellowship that is the vlsi design program vdtt as it is called so that's entirely funded by industries but it's a challenge still i think industries are also not very forthcoming when it comes to supporting these students uh, some industries are beginning to do that but it's still some way to go i think uh, running fully sponsored masters programs is beginning to happen we have an mba program which is also fully sponsored by industries we have started a diploma program which is also fully self supported we have one mtech program but i think we have a long way to go you know for industries to come forward and and initiate or support some of these masters programs it's important to also orient our masters programs towards industries because like all us universities you know if you go to us university the masters programs you know are all linked to industries directly you do a masters to get a job and if you want to do a phd you actually don't need a p don't need a masters after your bachelor's you can directly join phd so that is a model that us universities have successfully been following in india now it's becoming a norm if you look at the prime minister's research fellowship scheme for phd students masters is not required you can do a phd directly after bachelor's when do you do masters only when you are looking for a job you know uh, immediately uh, after the masters so therefore aligning masters programs with industry needs aligning them you know to the jobs requirement is very critical and uh, unless we do that uh, you know uh, things are not going to be uh, good enough for our academic institutions things are slowly happening but i agree with you it's a long way to go thank you sir for the inspiring talk thank you very much yes sir so one last interesting question from a student sir out of all your discoveries and patents which one is your favorite the favorites are always the ones which you are which you are able to you know commercialize i think for a patent for a publication what is the metric which is you know the metric for a publication is citations i may have written great paper but if nobody cites that if nobody even reads that paper i might think it's a great paper but you know i would always have that feeling why is it that you know this is a good paper why nobody is citing kind of a thing but I, so therefore you we started measuring the impact of a paper through citations and similarly impact of a patent is it uh, the revenue that it has generated so i think uh, you know these are standard metrics now that we have followed that we have been following i think some of my patents have resulted in startups 
some of them have been licensed to industries big industries which are on the chip now so i think they are satisfying that thank you very much sir i am very much thankful to you for covering major areas which is truly transdisciplinary approach like uh, bio nano and the info and also i am very happy that you have even uh, covered quantum technology which includes basic research because sometimes we forget the basic research as well so thank you so much for uh, including that topic in your research and also we would like to join with the, the major ice vit also would like to join with you and i hope our faculty members will be waiting to collaborate with all iits and already some of the iits we are in collaboration thank you very much sir and there are some more questions which is being posted in the chat box so i request you if you have time maybe you can ask uh, you can just uh, reply to the mails or our organizers will be approaching you you can uh, they, they, they will help you to reply to the mailbox to the chat box which is being posted thank you so much once again sir thank you thanks a lot thank you ma'am thank you ma'am for your valuable time Uh, once again i thank our speaker professor ram kopal rao for accepting our invitation and honoring the session with the interesting topic of uh, creating a culture of innovation in our academic institutions it was very interesting and informative sir thank you so much for your valuable time sir now i request our dean academic research dr p ramesh prabhu to chair the next session over to you sir uh very good morning uh, professors and uh, audience uh, i have great pleasure uh, in being a, a chairperson to uh, professor yoshihira ayakawa from uh, the university of uh, shizuoka in shizuoka university uh, is a, is a, is right now honorable professor in the department of material science and engineering uh, uh, you know when i just read his uh, cv uh it is uh, mind boggling in fact uh, uh, if you look at his uh, cv i understand he yes he, uh, he did his uh, bachelor's in engineering and masters in engineering from the same university where he has been working for uh, more than 40 years it is one of the very rare uh, opportunities for a student to become a teacher in the same institute uh, you know he had a long stay, he has had a long stint at uh, the um, university of uh, shikawa uh besides uh, he has uh, visited uh, he has been a visiting scientist at the university of florida usc uh, visiting professors uh, professor in university of federal uh, at brazil as well as visiting scientist at the university of victoria um, canada uh, besides uh, he has um, his research interests include growth and characterization of bulk and nanostructured semiconductor materials for apple electronics photovoltaics thermo uh, thermoelectrics photocatalysts and bio imaging applications and um, is uh, he has been um, making a great contribution uh, experiments related to microgravity uh, he has published more than 15 books uh, he has uh, he has got more than 350 uh, quality publications with 124 proceedings and um, he has uh, made about um, 1200 presentations across the globe and uh, he is a recipient of many uh, prominent awards that include uh, takanai encouragement prize saito in, in encouragement prize uh, takanai uh, nagi uh, prize award of uh, tokai uh, branch of this uh, uh, branch of japan applied physics society lifetime achievement award for research promotion at the 5th international conference in nano science and technology uh, you know uh, the list is uh, practically endless in fact he is a member of uh, Jap japan society of applied physics the J japanese association for crystal growth and J japan society of uh, microgravity application uh, the credentials are uh, really uh, very very significant i have great pleasure uh, in uh, thanking profusely professor yashihiro ayahagawa for uh, you know finding his schedule uh, to express his uh, 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 experience with the audience. Over to Professor Yashiro Hayakawa. Thank you very much for kind introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, okay. Ah, thank you very much for Professor Ramesh Babu for kind introduction. I'm Yashiro Hayakawa uh, from Japan.
pointers, making pointers. Okay. But not here. Okay. So at first, uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Professor Rajan Babu and all organizing committee members uh, to give me a chance to, to, to talk about the research activities. Now, uh, the spreading of coronavirus is increasing all over the world. So uh, we cannot visit the foreign countries to attend the conference. So this kind of virtual international conference is a very a good opportunity for us to exchange ideas and to learn for different research fields. So today, uh, I would like to talk about the photosensitive nanoparticles for bioimaging. And this work is, uh, uh, is done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Tangaraj and Dr. Mohammed. Uh, they are Indian and they uh, 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 they uh, visited to my uh, university as a researcher and a doctor student and made uh, this kind of research. And also Professor Shimura and Professor Inami and Professor Kawata of the Shizuoka University. So at, at first, I would like to briefly introduce the, uh, our campus. Uh, my campus is belong to the Hamamatsu city. This is between Tokyo and uh, Osaka. It takes about two hours from build trains. Our prefecture is very famous for Mount Fuji. This is a very beautiful um, uh, mountain. And also, our city is uh, uh, many companies, like uh, uh, automobile company like uh, Suzuki and uh, Honda, and uh, music instrument company uh, like uh, Yamaha and uh, Kawaii. And also, our prefecture is very famous for the tangerine melon and the Japanese green tea and so on. This is the, our campus. Uh, here's a very small campus compared to the VIT, but uh, you can see the Pacific Ocean over there and the uh, uh, sky is very clean. So if you have a chance to visit Japan, please uh, come to the uh, Shizuoka University. And uh, Professor Rajan Babu uh, stayed here in 2013 and 2019 as a visiting professor. So uh, we make a collaborative work. So I appreciate this kind of collaboration with VIT. This is a, a research activity of my laboratory. Uh, we have making a microgravity studies on our semiconductors and the growth of silicon germanium, German tin, indimigal antimonite, bismuth antimonite, and the polymer materials for thermal electric devices. And the synthesis of titan dioxide, zinc oxide, and the tin dioxide data nanoparticles for dye sensitized solar cell. And synthesis of uh, titan dioxide, nickel sulfide, molybdenum dye sulfide, titan dye sulfide, and zinc sulfide nanocomposite, uh, molybdenum dye sulfide, dye sulfide, and zinc sulfide nanocomposite, and the copper sulfide and zinc sulfide another composite for catalytic application. And today, I would like to talk about the synthesis of photosensitive nanoparticles for bioimaging. Here is the outline of my presentation. I briefly introduce the uh, bioimaging, and then I introduce the synthesis of manganese doped zinc sulfide and the ethylene elevin doped sodium gum fluoride nanocomposite for March model deep tissue imaging. And uh, I also introduced a synthesis of ethylene trim doped sodium fluoride copper coercial structure for bioimaging and uh, photosomal efficiency. And uh, finally, I'll just summarize my talk. So his, this is an uh, annual number of deaths by cause. The most uh, uh, dangerous disease is uh, cardiovascular diseases this is an attack of the heart and so on. Second disease, can, uh, this, is, this is, is the cancers. And uh, uh, recently, as you know, corona uh, is the uh, uh, most dangerous uh, disease. Uh, so there are so many uh, diseases, but one of uh, the uh, dangerous disease is cancer. There are several techniques uh, for bioimaging, 
uh, this table shows the techniques and the advantage and disadvantage. Radio leveling is uh, easy to image, but a lack of safety. And uh, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, is a uh, soft tissue imaging, but uh, less sensitive. Electron spin resonance microscopy is uh, high sensitive, but under development and expensive. Electrochemical detection is a quantitative detection, but a lack of sensitive imaging. Cholesterol emission tomography is a deep, ima deep imaging, but expensive. Compared to these techniques, a fluorescent imaging is a uh, emission of light by a substance that has absorbed light with other electromagnetic radiation. The emitted light has either longer wavelengths or shorter wavelengths than the absorbed radiation. The advantage of the fluorescent imaging is a readily available instrument enables high sensitive, non-invasive and safe uh, detection. This is an example of the uh, bioimaging. The uh, several kinds of nanoparticles uh, injected into the uh, near the skin of the mouse and the light is irradiated and uh, the emission from the nanoparticles is uh, detected. Green emission shows the green fluorescent floating, and the yellow uh, shows the zinc sulfide capped cadmium selenide quantum dots in polystyrene beads, and the red color shows the zinc sulfide quantum dots in polystyrene beads. So bioimaging is an image of biological molecules, cells, and tissues and its activities, and tag my uh, biomolecules with different image probes to obtain images from different sites. And the emission from probes induced by single to a multiple photon excitation. This graph shows the absorbance as a function of wavelengths. And this is absorbance absorption of the oxygen for blood. And this is skin. And this is fat. From this uh, graph, we can find the absorbance is lower than absorbance in the range of 650 nanometer to 1,300 nanometer. This region, the absorbance is lower than the other wavelength region. So this region is very beneficial uh, to use the imaging probes. This region is called therapeutic window. This graph shows the, the penetration um, with this as a function of wavelengths. As a shorter wavelength light cannot penetrate longer in tissue. However, when the wavelength increased, it can penetrate longer in tissue. In, in tissue. So penetration depth depends, uh, depths into the brain is 100 micrometer to three centimeter which depends upon the light uh, wavelengths. So uh, the nanoparticles using this uh, therapeutic window region is very important to synthesize. So size control reminiscence nanoparticles with the capability of near infrared light, near infrared light, light, light uh, emission is effective for tissue imaging, diagnosis, and the therapy. So I would like to shift to the topic of the synthesis of, synthesis of magnesium of zinc sulfide, ethylene element of sodium dichloride, now composite for much more deep tissue imaging. So zinc sulfide is an ideal host for manganese, which leads to luminescence by down conversion. And the beta sodium dichloride is an efficient host for ethylene element which leads to reminiscence by up conversion. So, however, the synthesis of multifunctional nanoparticles with capability of up conversion and down conversion emission is difficult. So, purpose of our research is synthesis of magnesium dissolved zinc sulfide, ethylene element of sodium carbon fluoride nanocomposite in a single step hot injection method. And the investigation of down conversion and the up conversion emission of these nanoparticle composites. And the bioimaging experiment using living HeLa cells. 
So at first, I would like to show the synthesis of magnesium of zinc sulfide. This is once we use the one flask and the zinc acetate and the sulfur and the manganese acetate. This is mixed with the oral amine. This is sol uh, solvent. And uh, the gas at 160 degrees C and the vacuum. And heated to 280 degrees C and the nitrogen for one hour. And uh, decompose the acetates and the synthesize magnesium of zinc sulfide quantum dot. And cool to room temperature and wash with acetone and disperse in cyclohexane. So this kind of uh, nanoparticle is synthesized. So next, I would like to show you how to synthesize the sodium chloride. So at first, we uh, prepare the uh, rear has uh, uh, acetate. The acetate. Uh, the acid oxide was dissolved in trifluoroacetate to water, one to one uh, solution, and the heat at 80 degrees C for 12 hours. And the undissolved oxides were removed by filtration and dry the solution at 60 degrees C to remove the superfluorous liquid. And uh, prepare the, this kind of material and uh, then uh, sodium trifluoroacetate, uh, uh, gathering ytterbium, erbium trifluoroacetate uh, is mixed with the oral amine and heat at 160 degrees C and the vacuum for 30 minutes and heat at 330 degrees C and the vacuum for hour and cool to room temperature and wash with ethanol. And this kind of uh, particle, non particle is formed. So uh, next I would like to show is how to so, um, make the uh, nanocomposite. We use the hot injection method. We prepare the two flasco as shown this picture. And uh, uh, at first the uh, sodium chloride is, uh, is uh, prepared using the, uh, this flasco. And uh, using this flasco, zinc acetate, acetate and sulfur and the magnesium acetate and the oregano mixed and the gas and the uh, vacuum at 160 degrees C. And this solution is mixed to the, this flasco and the heat at 280 degrees C and the nitrogen for one hour. One hour and heated to 330 degrees C and the nitrogen for one hour, and the cool to room temperature and wash with ethanol and disperse in cyclohexane. So I would like to uh, show the experimental result. This is an XRD uh, analysis of this zinc, magnesium of zinc sulfide. This is the XRD pattern, and this is the zinc sulfide uh, JSPDS standard uh, XLP. So the peak position is correspond with the standard pattern. So zinc sulfide is formed. Here is the uh, sodium chloride, uh, and this is the standard pattern of the sodium chloride. So also the peak position is correspond to the standard uh, JSPDS card. So we succeeded to synthesize the sodium chloride. And uh, here is the uh, magnesium of zinc sulfide and the ethylene element of sodium chloride mixed uh, nanoparticles. We can find the uh, peak, peak pattern of the zinc sulfide and the sodium chloride. So synthesized composites show the clear peaks of both magnesium of zinc sulfide, this is a cubic phase, and the uh, ethylene element of sodium chloride, this is a hexagonal phase. This is a, a thermal image and a HR thermal image, high resolution thermal images. Here is the advantage of zinc sulfide. You can see the small uh, nanoparticles. And this range is uh, 10 uh, nanometer. And this is two nanometers. And the uh, uh, size distribution is, uh, uh, is drawn here. Uh, the size is, uh, is uh, uh, between two and six uh, nanometer and nearly a homogeneous uh, size of the nanoparticle is formed. This is three nanometers. This is uh, enlarged uh, thermal images, and uh, we can find the uh, lattice fringe, 
fringe. This is 3.02 ohm strong. This corresponds to the 111 plane of the zinc sulfide. This shows the sodium chlorofluoride. And uh, you can see the nanoparticles. This size distribution is uh, drawn here. Uh, this range between eight, eight nanometer to uh, 17 nanometers. This is larger than the uh, zinc sulfide. Uh, this is uh, a, a high resolution term images. Uh, the fringe and uh, spacing of the fringe is 5.42 ohms. On. This is one to zero plane of the sodium chlorofluoride. And uh, this one is a uh, uh, composite of the film uh, image was composite. And this is enlarged photograph. We can uh, uh, observe the uh, sodium chlorofluoride as uh, this green region and the uh, zinc sulfide, this literally this circle. So we succeeded to synthesize this kind of nanocomposite. This is a, a upper conversion image uh, under 336 nanometer. This is the excitation uh, spectrum and the emission spectrum of the zinc sulfide of zinc sulfide. And this is uh, intensity and this is wavelength. The uh, emission at uh, 404 nanometer, this one, and also 587 nanometer. This, this one is observed by the excitation by using the 336 nanometer laser. So this is an image. UV light irradiate to the magnesium of zinc sulfide and the yellow emission is obtained. This one shows the uh, zinc sulfide and the sodium chloride uh, composite. We can, we can obtain the more broad uh, emission peak compared to the zinc sulfide. And uh, this uh, color is a uh, reddish yellow color emission is obtained. So this shows the, uh, by irradiating the UV light, we, uh, the emission in the visible light uh, occurred. This is called the uh, down conversion. So this is the up conversion uh, under the 980 nanometer laser. So this is a, a setup of the measurement, and this is a, a picture of the uh, setup of the instrument. So the, uh, we put this, the uh, nanoparticles here and irradiate the light uh, laser. Uh, the wavelength is 980 nanometer and uh, through the uh, fiber. And uh, uh, emitted light is uh, detected through the fiber and uh, uh, detected using the spectrometer. So this one is a uh, uh, emission from the sodium chloride. The uh, emission at 522 nanometer and uh, 542 uh, nanometer. This is the green emission. And uh, here is a uh, uh, 654 nanometer emission. This is a red emission. This is a uh, 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 emission uh, uh, from use from the sodium chloride in water. We irradiate the uh, infrared light and uh, uh, emit the green light. So this means a uh, uh, low energy light. This is a longer wavelength light irradiates the uh, particles and we get uh, high energy uh, emission. This is called up conversion. And this is the zinc sulfide and the sodium chloride nanocomposite. Uh, compared to the sodium chloride, the emission of the uh, lead uh, emission is increased, enhanced. So uh, this is the color, uh, uh, yellow color, yellowish uh, emission is obtained from the uh, nanocomposite. This one is the uh, uh, energy transfer scheme. I explained the down conversion and the up conversion using this uh, slide. So now we see that the uh, zinc sulfide and sodium chloride, the nanoparticles, uh, this is the uh, nanocomposite. So interparticle energy transfer occurred between the luminescent particles closer than 10 nanometer. 
So when the uh, UV light is irradiated, the excitation occurs like this, and uh, lost uh, some energy by the heat. And then transition occurs to the uh, energy level of the manganese from T1 level to uh, A1 level. This is a, a yellow color emission. And, and also, uh, this is the sodium fluoride, and uh, the uh, excitation level of the ethylene and erbium is uh, written here. This energy level and uh, this energy level is nearly equal. So this energy, this energy transfer to the uh, erbium uh, excitation level here, here and here, and the uh, green emission and the red emission occurred. So by using the UV light, we obtain the emission of the visible light. This is down conversion. In the case of up conversion, uh, this is a, a ethylene uh, transition uh, level. The UV uh, infrared light irradiate. So this transition occurred. And also, uh, erbium site, this transition occurred. This transition, this transition near the same uh, energy level. This energy, this, uh, uh, this is one photon excitation, and this uh, uh, level get the energy from this, and the two photon uh, excitation curve. So like uh, one photon and two photon. So, and then uh, transition occurred. So green and red emission curve. So from using the uh, low energy light, we get the high energy emission. This, uh, this is the uh, scheme of the up conversion. So this is the uh, up conversion imaging, uh, and uh, uh, this is a measurement system. We put sample here and uh, irradiate the uh, LED light. Uh, the wavelength is 970 nanometer. This is a uh, infrared light. And the uh, excited emission is detected the CMOS camera through the low pass filter. So this is this one is a uh, Hera cell, cell. This is a cancer cell. Uh, it uh, uh, incorporates the zinc sulfide, magnesium zinc sulfide, and ethylene erbium of sodium gabfluoride. Nanoparticle is put into the inject, inject, injected into the cancer cell. This is a phase contract. Uh, this is a, a, a up conversion image. We irradiate the cancer cell uh, using 970 nanometer excitation and obtain the emission from the uh, nanoparticles in the cancer cell. So uh, distinguished emission centers around Tira cell nuclei indicates the presence of the composite nanoparticles. This image shows the down conversion and uh, also this is a cancer cell uh, uh, with the nanoparticles and the phase contract. And this one is the image uh, by the excitation of 365 nanometer. So we also obtain the emission from the uh, nanoparticles uh, from the cancer cell. So uh, magnesium dope zinc sulfide and the ethylene erbium dope sodium chloride nanocomposite could be used as an up conversion and down conversion luminescence imaging agent. This shows the uh, cyclotoxicity measurement of uh, nanocomposite uh, using the uh, calcium uh, acidium home dimer dyes. And the uh, uh, green emission shows, uh, shows the living cell and the red emission shows the dead cell. And uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, only HERA cell, uh, cancer cell, and this is the uh, cancer cell with the uh, nanocomposite. And uh, the uh, viability of the HERA cell, cell is about 99.26 to 99.9. In, when the uh, nanoparticles uh, in, in doubled, the, uh, the percentage is a bit decreased to 
99.3 to 99.5 percent. But uh, nearly a uh, uh, very small uh, change in viability of the HERA cells with null composite compared to the normal cell. So I would like to summarize, summarize the first part. Manganese of zinc sulfide and the ethereum element of sodium galafluoride nanoparticles were synthesized using the thermal decomposition method. And uh, this uh, nanocomposite was synthesized by single step photo injection method. Down conversion emission of manganese of zinc sulfide revealed broad emission spectrum in the visible region in presence of uh, sodium galafluoride. And the upper conversion emission experiment showed enhanced lead emission in presence of manganese of zinc sulfide. And the bioimaging experiment using living HERA cells suggests that this composite can be used for multimodal imaging. This is published at the RSC advances. So I move to the next uh, topics. This is synthesis of ethereum trim doped sodium galafluoride and kappa coercial structure for bioimaging and the photosomal efficiency. Uh, Professor uh, Yashihiro, uh, uh, you have five minutes more, sir. I would request you to accelerate and... Uh... More for only five? Yes, sir. You have five minutes more and we have another five minutes for uh, discussion, sir. Oh, okay, okay. I... Thank you. Thank you. So this this is a, a, a phototherapy, a photosomal therapy. This is a process of treating cancer using some deactivator materials. So, so I hurry up. I'm sorry. I think the uh, 45 minutes. <laughs> so sorry. And uh, this is a, a purpose uh, of the uh, synthesis of quasi uh, structure. So this is a. Uh, 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 Techniques to synthesize the, uh, this kind of quasi uh, structure. This is I have already explained, and also uh, copper nitrate and orelamine, and it, this solution is mixed to the, this solution and uh, make uh, this kind of quasi uh, structure. This is the XRD pattern of the uh, sodium chloride, and this is the. Uh, Kappa and sodium carbon fluoride and composite. We can find the uh, X-ray peak from kappa and the sodium carbon fluoride. So mixed base was formed. This one is a, a TEM image of the sodium carbon fluoride, and this is a TEM image of the quasi uh, uh, structure. We can find the Moore pattern in the and the. Uh, the shell, the shell thickness is about five to 10 uh, nanometers. This is a kappa. And this is a, a, a stem image. We can find the sodium gathering, flooring, and ethereum trim and kappa. The uh, intensity of the kappa is higher than the other element because of this is a, a, a shell. Uh, Kappa is a shell structure. And uh, this is a, a EDS mapping. We can find the old element. And uh, this is a point uh, EDS mapping. And uh, this region, we can find the only kappa. This is a pattern. You can see the core and the shell. And the shell region, uh, kappa exists. And this is a uh, upper conversion uh, image, and this is a sodium galafluoride. This is copper. Near the same uh, uh, emission is ob observed, and this is the, uh, this image. And uh, this scheme is uh, uh, similar to the previous I explained. So uh, this up conversion, two photon uh, excitation occurred, and uh, we measure the bio imaging. This is a HERA cell. Uh, with, and the light of 970 nanometer uh, laser, and the emitter light is uh, detected by CCD using the bandpass filter. This is a conversion image of the HERA cell. This is only HERA cell, and this is a sodium galafluoride with the HERA cell. 
we can observe the emission from the cancer cell. And this is a HeLa cell with the uh, glacial structure. Also, we observe the emission from the HeLa cells. So uh, good emission shows the bioimaging from the cancer cell. We also measure the uh, photosomal studies. Here's a sample, and we irradiate the laser and measure the temperature. This is a, a, a temperature as a function of time. And this is only water. And this is the Senegal fluoride that incorporates the water. And this is a precious nanoparticle incorporated water. So when the laser is irradiated, temperature increase. And then when the laser is turned off, uh, temperature decrease. And uh, the increase of the temperature is, uh, is enhanced by uh, the, the doping of the uh, nanoparticles. And uh, this is a, we measure uh, uh, half times similar result is obtained. So we irradiate the 980 nanometer laser and uh, obtain the increase of the temperature. This is the uh, uh, absorbance of the uh, sodium chloride, and also this is the quartial structure. The absorbance of, uh, of the quartial structure is enhanced compared to the sodium chloride. This may be because the uh, localized surface plasma resonance of copper enhances the absorbance. We calculate the uh, photosomal efficiency using, um, using this uh, table, and the uh, photosomal efficiency was 27.3% per core and 36.3% per quartial nanoparticles. So quartial nanoparticles can be used as vital source of photodynamic photo. Uh, Group. So I would like to summarize my this session. Uh, yttrium yttrium doped sodium chloride and copper quartial nanoparticles are synthesized by hot injection method. XRD analysis reveals that quartial structure has the hexagonal sodium chloride and the cubic uh, copper, respectively. Team images was evidence of quartial structure with the average size of 48 to 49 nanometer and the shell thickness about 5 to 10 nanometers. STEM images and the EDS mapping provides the evidence of the presence of every compound in the quartial structure. Up conversion emission showed high, higher emission at 798 nanometer, and the mechanism reveals the energy transfer scheme. And the biomimic shows a good emission from the cancer cell. And the quartial compound shows the photo summer efficiency of 36.6%. Uh, this is the virus of the particle particle systems calculation. And uh, finally, I would like to thank the uh, student of uh, uh, Masuda, Tanaka, and Sugimoto, and also technician at, of the Suzuka University. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, uh, for your uh, one wonderful talk entitled Photosynthesis Nanoparticles for Bioimaging. Uh, I think it is, uh, it cannot be, uh, nobody can overemphasize the importance of. Uh, uh, biomedical imaging, bioimaging, uh, for the reason any small progress that is made will have a profound impact on society. It is one of the very con uh, uh, important topics uh, of great relevance for the uh, human at large, uh, human being at large. And uh, now I would request, uh, there are some questions from the audience, sir. Uh, I'll be uh, happy to share those questions. Uh, one of the questions has been, uh, is there any critical size of the nanoparticle? Uh, is there any constraint on the critical size of the nanoparticle for uh, biomedical imaging? Uh, yes, and uh, if the uh, particle size is increased, the we can uh, the cancer cell cannot uh, uh, receive or uh, the nanoparticle cannot uh, uh, invade into the cancer cell. So. Uh, smaller size, small size is uh, important. Uh, oh. This range is uh, several, um, within the several uh, 10 nanometer. So oh. we synthesize the very small nanoparticles. If the nanosize is very larger, uh, it's more difficult to make uh, this kind of uh, uh, load uh, bioimaging. So size is also very important. Thank you. Thank and you, the, the problem is uh, uh, the structure 
the size increased compared to the uh, nano uh, particles because of this coron shell. But uh, uh, we succeeded for the bioimaging of, of, in this case. Thank you, sir. We also, this has many, many different kinds of size, different kind of size particles, and uh, uh, also you check this this point. Okay, sir. Another question: How stable are these nano composites? And the, the, the person also wants to know the direction limit hmm? involved. How how stable are these nano composites? Uh, stable. Uh, how stable? Yeah. Uh, yes, and. Uh, 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 the nanoparticle itself is uh, no problem, uh, but we have not measured the uh, uh, lifetime of the nanoparticles after invading and uh, putting into the cancer cell. Okay. We have not uh, measured the uh, stability of the nanoparticles in the cancer cell, but uh, only nanoparticle is uh, very stable. Sir, another question, uh, does the band gap have any uh, connection with the bioimaging as such? Yes, yes. So uh, if we try to use this nanoparticle in the uh, uh, bioimaging, we need uh, uh, emission in the uh, therapeutic window, some uh, range, some uh, wavelength range uh, absorption by the blood small is small. So we need a uh, uh, near infrared uh, light is very important to penetrate into the tissue. So uh, this is, uh, depends on the uh, band gap, also uh, excitation level. So uh, the sodium, uh, sodium galliferol is a host and the zinc sulfide, sulfide is a host. And the manganese and the ytterbium, ytterbium, and this kind of uh, uh, some excitation level is very important to obtain the near infrared emission. Uh, sir, uh, another question is uh, how how the effect of water diffusion uh, in living cells can be reduced by using this uh, uh, nano composite, using a particular nano composite. How you, the effect of water diffusion in living cells? Water, can be water, water, water diffusion, diffusion, water diffusion. How the effect of water diffusion in living cells can be reduced by using uh, this particular nano composite? Water diffusion. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, water, water. Uh, water, water sense emission. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, uh, we need uh, uh, nanoparticles have to be uh, is uh, more uh, what to say uh, compatible with the water because we our body a lot of water. Okay. So, uh, uh, so, uh, you, your question is a little mention of the nanoparticles in the water. A little mention. A little particles is combined in water. That's you. Oh. Uh, Okay. Sir. Just for uh, diffusion. Uh, diffusion. Uh, diffusion. Uh, diffusion. Uh, diffusion. So nanoparticles, we can uh, obtain the uh, dispersed uh, nanoparticles in water. Dispersed, not not like uh, so collaborate, uh, agglomerate, agglomerate. Oh. I'm sorry, oh, my oh. English is not so good. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, there are other few questions which probably the organizer will be able to pass it on to you for your comment. Uh, I take this opportunity to once again thank you professionally uh, for your uh, uh, excellent talk, uh, which really, uh, you know, would have uh, kindled a lot of interest, uh, especially among the uh, in scientists who want to, uh, you know, uh, pursue a research in this field. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for your valuable time. Uh, I thank our speaker, Professor Hayatawa, for accepting our invitation and honoring the session with the interesting topic of photosensitive nanoparticles for bioimaging. It was very interesting and informative. Uh, thanks again, sir, uh, for joining the session. Thank, thank you. you very much.
thank you professor thank you thank you dear participants uh, formally we are closing the session now uh, the next session will start at uh, 2:30 pm as we mentioned in the mail uh, requesting you to come and join 10 minutes before the session starts thank you ठीक है सर